This lesson is for section 4.2. We're going to be solving linear systems graphically, and we are also going to be working on some word problems, and you're going to learn um, how to do a new type of word problem that you probably have never seen before, so make sure that you tune in for the last part of the lesson. Um, when you solve a linear system by graphing, what you're going to do is graph the line using the appropriate form. So if it's in standard form, use intercepts. If it's in point-slope form, use point-slope form, etc. Um, you're going to estimate the course of the point of intersection because sometimes it's not it, graphing can be unreliable. Um, and then you want to check your coordinates algebraically to just make sure that your coordinate is correct. So actually what I did was I started off with a uh, system where the graph is very unreliable. So if I were to try to graph this using intercepts, I have an intercept at 3.5, 0, and at 0, 1, and I have another intercept, or for the second line, let's do it in blue, I have intercepts at 3, 0, and 0, negative 4.5. So I'm just using um, you know, the cover-up method where I cover up the variable and solve for the other variable to find the intercept. So graphing the red line, I'm at 3.5 and, and 1, and actually if I increase the size here then uh, I can see it a little bit better but I've got this line here and the blue line 3 0 and 0 negative 4 and a half looking somewhat like this okay now graphically it's very difficult to figure out exactly where that point of intersection occurs it doesn't occur at 3 0 because the graph um, for the red line contains the point three and a half zero. So it, it can't go through three zero because three zero would not satisfy this top equation. So in this case, for this type of problem, you have to check your solution algebraically. Now I'm gonna check that algebraically with you and, and actually work out a lot of the solution myself just so that you can see what my method would be when I get this nasty fraction that, that actually occurs here at that intersection. Okay, so as you can see, I actually used elimination here. Um, the first thing I did was I tried to eliminate the y's. So, or I'm sorry, the x's. So I multiplied by negative 3 on the top and, and 2 on the bottom. And then my resulting equation after I um, added them together ended up being negative 25y equals negative 3. Now this produced a really ugly fraction. And rather than plugging that value back into the original and solving for the x, I thought, you know what, it might be just easier for me to resolve the system and eliminate the y variables. So this could be a way for you to also um, solve a little bit quicker by, by actually solving the system a second time, but this time eliminating the y's. So I, I multiplied by 2 and then 7 to get these two equations here. And then when I added those up and I eliminated the y's, I'm left with 25x equals 77 and x equals 77 over 25. So the coordinate, that point here, which would be basically impossible for us to try to estimate unless we were to graphically get one of those numbers and, and really, I guess you would have to almost use your calculator to figure out what that point of intersection is, but um, you get the point, oh I'm sorry, 77, 25, 3, 25. So this is the coordinate which would have basically been impossible to try to just estimate it from you know, a sketch that you would graph by hand. Now, I would like you guys to try 2 and 3 using the appropriate method and um, pause the video and then we'll talk about the solution and what you're going to get when, and how to write your solution here. Okay, in problem number 2 what I did is I graphed the top line in blue and I started at the coordinate 7, negative 3, or negative 7, 3, I'm sorry, and then I graphed um, the slope from there. So I got this blue line. When I graph the red line and I graph the points 5, 0, and 0, 3, because those are the intercepts, I end up with this red line. And I notice that these lines are actually parallel to one another. These are never going to cross because consistently the slope between them is going to stay the same. So here I would write out no solution and explain why, because there are parallel lines. Now in problem number 3, when I graph the blue line, I start at the point negative 6, negative 5. So here, and then I went up one and up to the right two, um, and I got this blue line here. And then when I graphed the red line underneath it, I ended up with the exact same line. So this would be infinite solutions. So I write all points, or I could even write um, infinite points on the line. And that particular line um, in standard form was 4x minus 8y equals 16. So this is what I write now. Um, instead of just writing no solution or infinite, you know, with an infinite symbol, you're going to write out this explanation here. 
Okay, now moving on to the word problems. These are system application problems. Now these are notoriously difficult sometimes for students to do because they don't really read the question very carefully. So um, the first thing you want to do is to always define your variables because I think that makes it a little bit easier for you once you start to um, see a pattern, okay? So we're going to find the value of the sum of two numbers if their sum is two and their difference is four. So it says to find the value of the sum of two numbers. So the sum of two numbers could be any two numbers. So I'm going to let x equal one number and y equal the other number. Now I'm going to use the information that they tell me. They said that the sum is two of these two numbers. So that would mean that x plus y should equal two. They also tell me that the difference is four. So I'm going to set up x minus y equal to four because this is what the difference is. So this is the system that would model this application problem. And we're not going to go ahead and solve each one of these because I think that's just a practice with what we did before. So we're just going to solve or set up the systems for right now. Tomorrow in class, you will solve and find the actual values for the x and the y. In problem five, it says that the school that Stephen goes to is selling tickets to a choral performance. On the first day, ticket sale or on the first day of ticket sales, the school sold three senior citizen tickets and one child ticket for a total of thirty-eight dollars. The senior or the school took in $52 on the next day by selling three senior citizen tickets and then two child tickets. We're supposed to find the price of a senior citizen ticket and the price of a child ticket. So right away they actually define the variables for us. I just want to make it more explicit here by saying let's let x equal the price of a senior ticket because that's what I'm trying to find. So if that's what um, is being asked, that's usually what you want to define, I mean almost always what you want to define your variables as. Now y is going to equal then the price of a child's ticket. And then we're just going to go from here and mirror what we see in the word problem. So it says that they sold three senior citizen tickets. Now if you sell three senior citizen tickets then you're going to multiply that by the price to figure out how much they actually brought in. So 3x represents I sold three senior citizen tickets at X price. And then I'm going to add in the fact that I also sold one child ticket at a child price. So that represents here the Y. And a total of 38 means that it's going to equal 38. So whenever they tell you a total, it usually means that you're going to put that number on the other side of the equation. Um, so this is one of the, the lines for our, our system. Now to find the other linear equation here, and these the other piece of information they tell us that for three senior citizen tickets again so three x plus two se uh, two child tickets this time they take in fifty two dollars so this here is the system that models that problem okay number six is a geometry application problem so there's some vocabulary terms that you're going to need to know for this chapter just basically a, a brief review of geometry when two angles are supplementary that means that they add up to 180 degrees so this is actually a, a part of the question that they're giving us is already giving us like a constraint here. They're saying that the two angles must add up to 180 degrees. So um, the next part they tell us that the larger angle is 48 degrees more than 10 times the smaller angle. This is a little bit trickier to try to rewrite, but um, we're going to do it by just breaking down the sentence. We're supposed to find the measure of each angle. So what I'm going to do then is let x equal the measure of the larger angle and y equal the measure of the smaller angle. So smaller angle here. And then I'm going to go ahead and look at my constraints. So it says two angles are supplementary. Well, if two angles are supplementary, that means that if I add them together, the measure of the, the larger plus the measure of the smaller should equal 180 degrees. So that takes care of the first sentence. Now the second equation is going to come from this part here. The larger angle is 48 degrees more than 10 times the smaller. Okay, so let's start with this part, the larger angle. We define the larger angle to equal x. So x is, now is means equals. So x is 48 degrees more than something else. So if I'm going to add something to this, that would be 48 degrees more, right? So 48 plus is adding that amount to 10 times the smaller angle. If I want to express 10 times the smaller angle, I take 10 and I multiply that by y, the measure of the smaller angles. So this is actually your system here. Just by breaking down that sentence, we can come up with a math equation that relates those words together. 
In problem number seven, it's asking you um, about a plane and it's flying with a head and a tailwind. So I want to define these first for you before we try to solve this problem, or set up this problem, I should say. Okay, so to solve this problem, we need to know what a headwind is. Now, a headwind implies that the plane is flying against the wind. So the plane is going to fly at a slower rate because the wind is pushing against the plane. So we call the speed of the plane right now the ground speed because overall we're going to use the idea that distance equals rate times time in order to set up this particular um, system of equations. So the rate that we want to use is the rate after we, we factor in the wind speed. Okay, now a tailwind, on the other hand, is coming at the tail of the plane. So it's coming from the back end of the plane. So it's actually aiding the, the plane in its flying. So it, it makes it f go faster, actually, than it normally would if we were just looking at the ground speed of the plane. So the, the tailwind helps the plane go faster. The um, headwind makes it go slower. So when we factor in the wind speed for a headwind, we want to take the rate of this, the plane, the ground speed, which we're going to define as x here, and the y, y equals the speed of the wind, we're going to take that to find the actual rate and subtract that from the ground speed because it, it hurts the plane. I get, not hurts, but you know, it makes it go slower. Okay. Now when we have a tailwind, this is going to help the plane go faster. So when we take the ground spe speed and the wind speed, we're going to add those two speeds together because the actual rate is now going to be faster than the normal ground speed alone. Now this basic idea can also be used when you're talking about going upstream and downstream when you're, you're looking at like a current in a river as well and you're going to do those application problems using the exact same method that we're going to use um, when we actually go to set up this system of, inequal, of, of equations. Okay, so when we take a look at number seven it says suppose it takes the small airplane flying with a headwind whoops, 16 hours to travel 1800 miles. Um, so recall that distance equals rate times time. This is something you probably have used plenty of times before either in biology or um, chemistry and I, I think you guys use this a lot but you've also probably used it in a math class before as well but um, they give us a distance here and they give us a time when you're flying with a headwind. Okay, So let's define our variables. We're going to let x equal the speed of your plane and y is going to equal the speed of the wind. Now if we're going to use distance equals rate times time, we already have a distance here, 1800. So I'm going to say 1800, this distance is equal to the rate. Now the rate of the plane, since the headwind does not help the plane, it actually takes away from its speed, we're going to say that this is x minus y. So the rate here is actually x minus y. We have to account for the fact that the headwind is going to take, you know, reduce the plane's speed. The time, it says is 16 hours, so we're just going to multiply that by 16. Then it says that the same plane, um, flying now with a tailwind, can, can travel that same distance in only 9 hours. So 1800, that distance, is staying the same. And this time, since it's with a tailwind, it's going to aid the plane, so we're going to say the speed is now x plus y. So it's the actual rate the plane flies at. And this time it's only 9 hours, so we're going to multiply that by 9. So our resulting system of equations here should be 16x minus 16y equals 1800 and 9x plus 9y equaling 1800. So this is the system that you could set up and solve to figure out exactly what the speed of the plane would be on the ground as well as the speed of the wind and what that was factoring in there. Okay, that is the end of this lesson. Nice job. Come tomorrow prepared to be able to set up and solve all of these uh, word problem systems.